Hello, I'm Chris Williamson and welcome to the latest edition of Palestine Declassified, where we investigate the Israeli regime's global war against solidarity with the illegally occupied people of Palestine. The new Prime Minister of the Zionist entity in Palestine is Yair Lapid. He's the 14th Prime Minister to head the regime since the creation of the entity in 1948. Like all the others, Lapid traces his origins to Eastern Europe, to Hungary and Romania to be precise. Yet these white Europeans claim to have a special right to occupy Palestine. In this episode of Palestine Declassified, we'll trace the national origins of Zionist leaders and examine their attempt to justify the occupation of Palestine. To set the scene and spark the discussion, we've got this special report from Bianca Rahimi. There is a rising tide of claims from apologists for the crimes of Zionism. They say they have been misunderstood. Palestinians might be indigenous to Palestine, but the Jews definitely are. What is called the Israel-Palestine conflict is a conflict over the same small piece of land by two rival indigenous people. But how true is this? And what are the consequences of the argument? In fact, most of the power structure of Israel is dominated by Ashkenazi Jews, who have no ancestral link to Palestine. Overall, despite very significant financial and infrastructural contributions from Western European countries, especially the US, UK and France, for example, via the Rothschild family, Eastern European Ashkenazim have been at the centre of the Zionist power structure since the early years of the 20th century. For example, most members of the Jewish National Council in Palestine prior to the founding of Israel in 1948 were Ukrainian. As is well known, key leaders of the Zionist movement hailed from Ukraine. Many, but not all, Ukrainian Zionists were close to the Ukrainian nationalist movement. For example, the far-right revisionist Zionist Vladimir Yevgenovich Yabotinsky was himself a direct descendant of Ukrainian Jewish settlers in Odessa. He famously consorted with the leader of the Ukrainian nationalists, Simon Petliora, a proto-Nazi responsible for the pogroms against the Jews and others. Arguably, Zionism and Ukrainian nationalism share certain affinities, which perhaps helps to contextualize the Zionist regime's ongoing support for the Zelensky regime. As early as January 2022, Israel began planning to transfer Ukrainian Jews to become colonists in the land of the Palestinians. Israel's Ministry of Alaya and Immigrant Absorption proclaimed, we call on the Jews of Ukraine to immigrate to Israel, your home. A later Zionist colonist from Ukraine, who was Prime Minister of the Zionist entity from 1969 to 1974, was Golda Mabovic. She claimed, I'm a Palestinian, but also denied that the Palestinian people ever existed. I'm a Palestinian. From 21 until 48, I carried a Palestinian passport. All in all, seven of the 14 Zionist Prime Ministers so far came directly from Russia, Poland, Ukraine or Belarus. The other seven were children of parents from modern Ukraine and or Belarus. Ariel Sharon, Ohud Elmert, Ishar Rabin. Lithuania, Ahud Barak. Poland, Benjamin Netanyahu. Hungary and Romania, Yair Lapid. Or Poland and America, Naftali Bennett. All presidents of the Zionist entity, bar three, came directly or indirectly from Poland, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, or in one case, Austria. The obsession with proving that the Jews, all of the Jews, are indigenous to Palestine flies in the face of the overwhelming evidence of the settler colonial nature of Zionism and the fact that most of those in charge originate in Eastern Europe. Even the Zionist paper Haaretz has published an article claiming that the argument that Jews are indigenous to Palestine swims in fascist waters. As always, we're joined by our resident expert, David Miller. David's an academic and former professor at Bristol University, and he's a leading British scholarly critic of Israel. He's also a co-founder and co-director of the lobbying watchdog Spinwatch. We're also joined today by Tony Greenstein. Tony is a veteran anti-Zionist activist. He's a founding member of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and of Jews for Boycotting Israeli Goods. He's a long-standing anti-fascist and author of A History of Fighting Fascism in Brighton and the South Coast. Tony is a prolific blogger and is about to publish a book titled Zionism During the Holocaust. Welcome to the show. Tony, let me start with you. You've 
written extensively, haven't you, about the history of the Zionist movement. <clears throat> Do you think many people know the principal leaders of the Zionist movement or actually from Ukraine and other Eastern European countries? Uh, I'm not sure. Many of them are, but not exclusively. The founder of political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, was a Viennese journalist uh, who worked in Paris. So he was a West European, not a East European. And arguably, Zionism was a West European phenomena directed at ensuring that East European Jews didn't come to Western Europe, mm. but went to Palestine. Mm. So uh, although the origins were in Poland and Ukraine, uh, the brains were in many ways in the West. Yes, indeed. I mean, I was, I was going to ask you, uh, David, uh, whether it's actually true that uh, Zionism originated in, in Ukraine. I mean, given what Tony said, I mean, what's your, what's your thoughts? Well, on in, that? in many ways it did. I mean, the, the, the Odessa area in, in Ukraine was a settler colony uh, where Jews came from other parts of, the, of mm. uh, the continent and settled there. Um, and then later, many of them moved to, uh, to Palestine and became part of the occupation of Palestine. Uh, the, the, the Odessa was known as being the gates of Zion. Many of the early Zionists came from Odessa. Jabotinsky, of course, famously uh, was, was uh, raised there in, in Odessa. And many of the Zionist youth groups that still exist today started in uh, the Ukraine or in uh, modern-day Belarus. So yes, there is a strong sense in which Ukrainian nationalism and Zionism, grew, which grew up in parallel, had something really very similar to each other. And that's an, int an interesting uh, aspect of the way in which Zionism as a form of nationalism has developed, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly it seems that there, there's an attempt by Zionist uh, leaders to sort of deny those uh, European origins. I mean, is that a fair assessment, do you think? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> you see, Zionism is based on the idea that it hates the Jewish diaspora. It wishes to wind it up. So it, it wishes to forget its origins. I mean, yes, most of them, Ben-Gurion, came from Plonska, a small town in Poland, for example. But they all changed their names to Hebrewize them, mm. and they all hated uh, the Yiddish, the language that was spoken by the East European Jews. That's why they created a new language, Hebrew, yeah. because literally they, they hated the Galut, as they called it. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, uh, we've just seen in the film, David, that uh, many of the Zionist leaders uh, changed the names in the, in the process of becoming settler colonialists, didn't they? I mean, how significant do you think that is? Well, I mean, they changed their names. I mean, Tony was talking about Ben Gurion. He's, mm. His name was Grun, uh, Green, and uh, um, Golda Meir, she changed her name. Uh, uh, all, almost all of them changed their name. Uh, Jabotinsky changed his name from Vladimir to Zaev. Uh, so mm. this is a part of a, a Judaization, Hebrewization of, of them, so that, they, so that it would appear that they had some kind of more intimate connection with Palestine than in, than in fact they did. And of course, it's part of the process of colonization to present themselves as being somehow how, how indigenous to the area. Like, just like the, the attempt to colonize hummus and falafel as being Israeli cuisine. Yeah. These are all part of the same thing. It's part of the process of colonization was the changing of the name. Yeah. I mean, Tony, do, do, does your work on the Holocaust and Zionism help us to understand the national origins of Zionism? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure it does. My work on the Holocaust really shows how the main priority of the Zionist movement right. during the Holocaust was building a Jewish state. What was happening to the Jews inside Europe is very much a secondary matter. Not only was it a secondary matter, but when people tried to find a place of refuge for the Jews who were, managed to flee from Hitler's inferno, the Zionists opposed it on the basis that well, if you could save Jews somewhere else, what was the point in having a Jewish state? Mm. That was the logic, uh, if you can call it that, they followed. I mean, David, t tell us about uh, Golda Meir's uh, description of herself as, as a Palestinian. Well, you saw that in the, in the film there. It's yeah. a, an interview from a British TV programme from some years ago. I, I'm a Palestinian. And, she, of course, she's, she was Ukrainian. And, uh, she moved to the States and then... To, to Palestine, and she said she talks about it in terms of, of the uh, the passport that she had between 1921 and 1948. Uh, she had a Palestinian passport, and uh, she talks goes on to talk about how there were there was no such thing as Palestinians. So she says, on the one hand, I was Palestinian, and on the other hand, there was no such thing as Palestinians. There were only Jews and Arabs, and that's an interesting way of putting it, I thought, because of course many of the 
Jews were Arabs. Uh, and this is an attempt to suggest that Jews and Arabs were not the same thing. So there's an attempt here as part of the colonising project to present Jews as being something entirely different from the, from the local people. I mean, I'm sure the discussion that, that, that we're having today will be seen as very controversial by the, uh, the, the Zionist uh, lobby and uh, no doubt will be accused of, of indulging in, in anti-Semitism again. I wonder, perhaps, David, how, how would you respond to, to those charges, maybe preempt some of the criticisms that, you know, that we're almost bound to get for you know, providing some factual, historical background to this uh, whole discussion? That I we're mean, you, you can't run away from this. This is the history of, uh, of the, the colonisation of Palestine. It's, this is not about, um, about Jews in, in general. This is about specific groups of people who, who came to colonise Palestine. Some of them came, uh, most of them came initially from, from Europe. Uh, or origins in, in Europe, and then others came uh, laterally from North Africa uh, and uh, from, from other parts of, uh, of West Asia. And th these people were t completely different people. They were a, a completely different ethnic group. Mm. Uh, they happened to share Judaism as a religion. And so there's an attempt in, in this historical process to, to, to flatten that distinction, to make it out as if there was only one Jewish people and that they had their roots historically in Palestine, which, of course, it turns out not to have been true. I mean, Tony, you're, you're Jewish yourself, a son of a, of a rabbi who confronted Oswald Mosley's fascists at the Battle of, of Cable uh, Street. I mean, you know, is this a case of, of Jewish exceptionalism, do you think, you know, with uh, sort of uh, the way in which, uh, you know, how the kind of Zionist lobby kind of uh, respond to discussions like this? Well, yes. I mean, Zionism is a, a movement based on Jewish exceptionalism that whatever anyone who's Jewish does... Uh, cannot be criticised, but the essence of Zionism in Palestine was that it was a Western European colonisatory movement. And in fact, they weren't even aware, most of them, of the fact there were Arab Jews. No, and no. Arthur Rupin, who was maybe the most important uh, personality in Palestinian Zionism before uh, the Second World War, uh, he was a social Darwinist. He, he believed in survival of the fittest, and he, he had this belief that the West European Zionists and Jews were not Semitic, unlike the Arab Jews. And so, for the hard labour in Palestine, he employed Yemenite Jews. But because of his pathological, uh, if you like, uh, uh, eugenicism, uh, they were paid starvation wages. They weren't yeah. given medical care. So. 50% of the Yemenite workers died off. They died yeah. off like flies because they had this attitude to them that they were the untermension. They were yes. the yes, uh, not, not fully human beings. Well, let, let, let's, just, let's just pause the discussion there for a moment because we've got another report now that examines the historical origins of the two main groups of Jews in the world today. Zionists increasingly deploy the idea that the Jews, considered as one indivisible people, are indigenous to Palestine. The term decolonized Judean is used by Zionists, often white Europeans, to describe themselves. But is there any remnant of the original Jewish people expelled 2,000 years ago amongst the two major groups of Jews in the world today? The dominant group, massively overrepresented at all levels of the power structure in what is called Israel today, are Ashkenazi Jews. Recent research in linguistics and genetics shows that the Rhineland hypothesis, which suggests that Ashkenazim comes from the Levant and Yiddish originates in Germany, is unable to explain the genetic, linguistic and cultural data now available. It suggests instead an Iranian-Turkish-Slavic origin for Ashkenazi Jews and a Slavic origin for Yiddish. A killer detail in the argument is the existence of along the ancient Silk Road trade route in northeastern Turkey of four primeval villages whose names resemble Ashkenaz, such as Ishkenaz. Ashkenazi Jews then appear to have no historical connection to the original Jews of Palestine. The Sephardi Jews are the second main group of Jews in the world. They're increasingly populous and according to some accounts now make up a majority of Jews in occupied Palestine. But they also face a well-known pattern of discrimination in relation to the white European Ashkenazi Jews. 
When they arrived in occupied Palestine, mostly after 1948, these groups often spoke a kind of Arabic and were sometimes referred to as Arab Jews. This was a threat to Zionism, which made sure to discourage their use of Arabic and astidiously work to de-racialize them. Some left Zionists and anti-Zionist groups tried to present the Sephardim as a benighted ethnic minority. But if the aim is to wean Sephardim away from ultra-Zionism, this is a strategy doomed to failure. Once they become settler colonists and their connections with the Arabs were severed, their primary loyalty came to be the Zionist project. But this cannot erase the fact that the Sephardim are Arab Jews, as is widely accepted in the humanities and social science research literature. Even more pointedly linguistic and genetic research shows that these so-called indigenous Jews are predominantly descendant from North African Berbers and Arabs. The truth is that Ashkenazi Jews come mostly from Eastern Europe, with origins in the Caucasus, Turkey and Iran. Sephardim are mostly of Arabic, Berber and some European origins. They are Arab Jews, with perhaps as little connection to Palestine as the Ashkenazim. There is no unitary Jewish people with any historically continuous claim to the land of Palestine. David, uh, um, what's the background to the academic and scientific literature that's overturned the idea that Ashkenazi Jews originated in Germany? Well, there's a guy called Wexler, Paul Wexler, who's a linguist uh, um, at a, a, an Israeli university. And uh, he's written several books on this topic. And uh, he's been joined more laterally by a number of others, including uh, a number of other Israeli Jewish uh, uh, social scientists and, uh, and uh, scientists who have done this kind of a, a geographical population studies, which have shown the, the way in which the, the Ashkenazi Jews originated along the trade route, so the, the Silk Trade route, Silk Road trade route, um, in northeast Turkey, going, coming up from Iran uh, through Turkey uh, and over towards the west. And and the, the work that they've done is, is is stunning, really. If you look at the the data which underlies it, and in particular showing the the Slavic origin of Yiddish, which they then say was relexified to German, i.e., most of the German. Uh, uh, vocabulary was was uh, replaced the original vocabulary, but the language itself was Slavic in origin. So th th this suggests that the that the Ashkenazi Jews are Slavic, Iranian, Turkish in in original origin, and, and don't have any real connection to to Palestine to the the Jews who were expelled back in uh, 70 AD. So it's a it's a really interesting scientific dispute, and there is a dispute about it. But yeah. it, but increasingly, it looks like the dispute has been, has been won and it's, it's becoming you know, a, a common position. Sure. I mean, Tony, uh, what's your view on this debate? I mean, how do Zionists react to the idea that uh, Yiddish is actually a Slavic language? I don't really know. I mean, I, I'm not sure that it's particularly relevant. I mean, Zionism makes many claims about the biological, the genetic, uh, the racial if you like, origins in Palestine. And to be quite honest, it really does not matter. There were 2,000, 3,000 years ago, there were many peoples, Canaanites, Moabites, you name it, Edomites, who were wandering over the land. The idea that you can now make a claim based on a particular group of people who lived in Palestine 2,000 plus years ago is absurd. I suspect if the West Bank settlers met the original Hebrews, they would be shot on sight as terrorists. I mean, that is the reality. They, you know, it's a complete rewriting of history back into time. So uh, I, I'm really not at all worried about it because it's completely bogus. Western colonists have always justified their presence in other people's lands by virtue of the Bible or mm. other religious mm. texts. Mm. I mean, I've got to say, David, this uh, I, uh, discussion about the origins of these Sephardic uh, Jews was kind of new to me. I mean, perhaps you could say a little bit more about that. Well, again, this is this guy Wexler, who's a linguist, and he's done this research. He's written a book on this, a whole, whole book on it, show, showing that, that uh, the Sephardic Jews, uh, the, I mean, the word is, uh, uh, is Hebrew for Spanish. So right. it's a, supposed to be Spanish and, right. and Portuguese Jews. Right. Uh, and, and actually, the, contrary to, to, to this, this conception, the, 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 the uh, eth ethnic origin and the, the genetic origins of, of the, this, these populations is in North Africa. 
and um, uh, from Berber and Arabic stock, and, so, and some European stock as well, with a, a really small component uh, of the original Palestinian Jews uh, from, from back in the day. So, the, so even the ones, the Sephardim, who are regarded as being kind of indigenous to, to Palestine, uh, don't have a, 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 a clear cl claim to that, and, have, and actually descend from the Berbers and from Arabs. They are, these, are, these are Arabs, and uh, so you know, there the, the shouldn't be a distinction between uh, mm. between Arab and, and Jew in the way that there, that there currently is in much debate. Mm. I mean, certainly this, this notion of um, uh, Arabic Jews seems to be quite w widespread in academic uh, literature. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, firstly, I mean, what you call Arab Jews often aren't Arab Jews. I mean, I, I'm no uh, an, uh, expert in the different ethnicities, but I understand Berbers are not Arabs and neither are Kurds, uh, but there are Jews uh, heavily concentrated amongst both groups. So Jews were indigenous, if you like, to uh, Arabia, but not particularly to Palestine. Uh, they dispersed. I mean, David said uh, the Jews were expelled in 70 AD. I have to say, this is a Zionist myth. <laughs> there is no evidence whatsoever that there was any expulsion. This, is, again, is history being rewritten back in order to justify a colonialist narrative. So, yes, of course... But you know what happened when the Arab Jews were brought to, brought to Israel after destabilization, because Zionism destabilized the community in Iraq, Morocco, etc. They were de-Arabized. They were treated as dirt. You look what happened to the Yemenite Jews. Thousands of their babies were stolen, literally, yeah. in the hospital. They were told they were dead. And then they were given to either American or Israeli Ashkenazi parents. And some of them were subject to quite horrific medical experiments. Yeah. I mean, all of this has come out despite yeah. three whitewash inquiries. So they were treated as dirt. They were recreated. They were de-Arabized. That, that is yeah. the reality of what happened. I mean, briefly, David, we haven't got much time left. Um, Arabic Jews, you know, Jews of Arab origin, do face discrimination. In, do you think that you know, gives us a, a prospect of a serious challenge to Zionism or not? I think not. I mean, I think that there's, there, there is a feeling uh, among some in the Zionist left and, and some in the anti-Zionist left that, that that might be something to work on. But, you know, I think if you compare it with other settler colonial situations, like especially the, the, the question of Ireland, you know, the, the, the settlers, are, are especially the working class in the settlers, are the ones who, who, are, who become the most devoted and the mm -hmm. most extreme. Uh, and that certainly is the case with Ulster loyalism. And I think probably it's also seen to be the case with, uh, with Sephardic Jews in, uh, inside the state mm -hmm. of Israel. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there now as we're right out of time. Thank you to Tony Greenstein and to you, David Miller, our resident expert, for joining us today. Please remember to follow the show on social media and we'll be back next week with more news and analysis on Palestine Declassified. So until next time, this is Chris Williamson saying bye for now.